Hi, my name is Joy. Welcome to Cascade Church. I am so glad you're with us this morning. And happy Father's Day. We're so glad that you're joining us, and we hope that you dads are feeling loved by your family, but also by us. So because of that, we're giving you a free coffee from Pilot House. Go down to Pilot House on Main Street, order your favorite drink, and let them know it's on us. In the crazy time that we've had with what's going on with COVID, it's been really hard to engage. I know it has been for me. So here's what I suggest. Bring a family into your home. Have breakfast and brunch together on a Sunday morning and enjoy worship time together and then study God's word. Or come on Tuesday night. Tuesday night, we're having prayer and worship time. This last Tuesday, we had prayer and worship and it was so refreshing to my heart to be able to be there with you and to sing together and pray. So come this week at 6 or 7.15. And then don't forget, mark your calendar, July 5th. It's when we're coming all back together to be together for worship. And I just can't wait to be with you. But for now, let's join Scott and the team for worship. As we consider the God that we worship this morning, let's remember these words from Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Either are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. There is no wonder why the psalmist proclaims, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world stand in awe of Him. Oh, who could know your thoughts? Who could grasp your ways? Who could match your goodness or deny your grace? You awake my soul, captivate my heart, oh God. Oh, how great you are.
privilege it is to get to worship together in our own homes, to get to sing to God, for he's the one who makes a way for us to, to have relationship with him and to get to worship him. Um, I'm excited to be here with you this morning. My name is Mitch. For those of you guys that don't know me, I'm the middle school youth pastor here, and it's my privilege to come and get to share with you this morning from the book of Galatians as we've been going through and learning how to love, live, and give the gospel. Um, it, today, by the way, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. Me personally, I'm getting to celebrate for uh, the second year in a row here as my son Jasper is about two and a half now. And uh, Jacob is our five-month-old and uh, growing, growing very quickly. Um, and during these past few months, I've been thinking about quite a bit as Jasper's growing up into this kid who who wants to 
be like his dad and who is acting like me and following me around, um, kind of realizing, wow, I want to be intentional with the son that I am raising and uh, all that that looks like. And, and I've just been contemplating a lot on how I'm going to raise sons in this gospel, into knowing Jesus. And I think that today we're going to talk about some elements that actually are applicable to that. So like I said, we've been running through the book of Galatians, and last week Joel talked with us about how this gospel that we've been given, that when we accept Jesus into our lives and we choose to keep in step with the Spirit, keep in step with God's Spirit, how that changes our character. It changes who we are at our very core. And so Joel was was walking us through this kind of battle of flesh and spirit, as in the end of chapter 5 in Galatians, Paul talks about, you know, the fruits of the flesh and how they battle against the fruits of the spirit and how those things are to be cultivated within us. And so um, that comes up a little bit today as well. But today we're going to look at if the gospel changes who we are at our core, then Paul jumps into talking about how that naturally changes how we relate to those around us. If the gospel changes who we are, then it will naturally change how we relate to those around us. And so today we're going to look at that. Um, But I want to start by going back to and reading, um, picking up from the last verse where Joel left off last week in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. And then we're going to read today's passage, verse 26 through chapter 6, verse 5. And it says this, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. The gospel changes the way we relate to others. And Paul talks about that here. And so I want to go through this passage and break down everything that Paul has said, because he comes right out of saying, hey, these are the fruits of the Spirit. If you're keeping in step with the Spirit, this is what your heart, what your character, what your life should look like. And and then he comes into this and he, he starts by saying, let us not become conceited provoking and envying one another. And so he kind of shifts gears from this inwardly focused, this is who we should be, this is who the gospel should make us into, and starts to focus on, okay, now that we are becoming that person, this then should be the result. And he starts off first by reminding us of the things that are are not of who we are in the context of relating to others. And he says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. After all, not one of the fruits that he had just mentioned. And and then he goes into chapter 6, verse 1. He says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. So Paul kind of dives in here and he says, uh, I think what we're going to find as we talk about this and as we go through this is this this endeavor to go and to keep in step with the Spirit, this Christian walk. Paul is reminding the Galatians that this is not something that's to be done alone. This cultivating, or as Joel talked about last week, he talked about pruning fruit fruit trees. And actually, as he was talking about that, I was thinking about um, my own message that I was planning for this week, and I had planned to use a similar story from my life. Um, When I was about seven years old, um, we got the opportunity, my brother and I, both got the opportunity to buy fruit trees that we would take care of. And at the time, I really loved and still do the Rainier cherries. 
you know, but the good ones, none of that red garbage, right? I want the yellow and red Rainier cherries. Those things are awesome. And so I wanted a cherry tree. My brother got an apple tree like Joel talked about last week. And I remember being so excited to put this thing in the ground one spring as the uh, summer season and eventually the harvest was coming, put this little tiny tree in the ground. And my expectations as a kid were that this was going to be something amazing. You know, I got to wait a couple months. I got to water this thing. Um, We had some fertilizer things that we added to them. And I'm like, yes, this is going to be awesome. I'm getting my own cherries this year. Um, And it's something that I get to produce. I get to cultivate. And I learned a hard lesson for those first few years because I learned that there's a lot more that goes into getting that fruit out of the tree than just planting it watering it and expecting something to happen. In fact, I remember one day coming out to see, you know, that first year about the time I was expecting to start seeing cherries and realizing, oh, it doesn't happen that fast. This tree has some maturing to do. It's got to grow. And then the next year as it grew up, um, I remember my dad going out there and cutting all the branches off of it. And I'm thinking, what? Where am I going to get the cherries? Like, when will I get these things? There were some hard lessons to learn in that cultivation or that pruning process. And Joel talked about last week how these fruits that are developed in our hearts as we keep in step with the Spirit, those things, we go through a pruning process, right? Uh, The biblical word for that would be sanctification. It's this lifelong process of learning to become more and more like Jesus, more and more like he created us to be. And so as we walk in relationship with him, we go through this pruning process. But what Paul is getting at here is that process, that's not that endeavor to become more like Jesus. That is not simply an individual thing that we actually are meant to play this as a, as a team sport, if you will. This is becoming more like Jesus as the spirit coaches us on these things. Uh, One of the things God uses to do that within us is our fellow believers. And Paul is reminding the Galatians here, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, meaning you who are walking with the Spirit, as is said in other translations, you who are keeping in step with the Spirit, as I've just coached you on, you should go and restore them. But you should do so gently and with caution As he says, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. So we do that gently and with caution. Those things don't go away. But this is this is a team effort. This is something God and the Holy Spirit uses other believers. And Paul gave us an example actually earlier in Galatians, where he talked about, and Michael talked with us a few weeks ago, um, about Paul opposing Peter when Peter was in sin, when Peter was conforming to uh, the, the Jewish beliefs that were pervasive at this time in Galatians, the very reason Paul was writing to them as they were being told they had to follow the old law, um, but also experience the grace of Jesus, right? And, and Paul talks about how he opposed Peter. I don't think that Paul hated Peter. I don't think that Paul uh, was at odds with Peter per se throughout his whole ministry, but Paul gave us an example of this is what it looks like. We're going to be caught in sin. That process, that pruning, that sanctification is something that goes on for the rest of our lives as believers, as we become more and more every day like Jesus, as we bear the fruit of the Spirit, as we keep in step with Him, every day. That is something that we need each other in. We need each other to make that happen. We need each other. We need the people that we can trust that have been there before and will be there again to come alongside us gently and restore us. In verse 2, Paul goes into this and he says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, I don't know if you remember two weeks ago when Michael talked to us, uh, and he spoke with us rather frankly about our culture and where we're at right now, and, and he talked about Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. The entire law is summed up 
in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. That is the entire Old Testament law, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus would uh, say this as well, and that's where Paul is, is getting this from, the entire law summed up in, in this, love your neighbor as yourself. And one of the best ways that we can do that, one of the best ways we can show love and that, that Jesus did with people in his ministry, the apostles did in their ministry, the early church did, and the Christian church has been known throughout history to do is to help carry the burdens of others. It's no secret, especially these days, um, that life comes with hardship. Life comes with burdens. Some, some examples of those things, um, you know, as Paul mentioned earlier, the sin and addiction and temptation that we get into to walk away from the Spirit, that can become a burden in people's lives. That can become a burden in believers' lives and non-believers alike that we who are keeping a step with the Spirit are called to take on with other people. Some other things that I see examples throughout Scripture and in life are uh, financial hardships. Financial hardships can be a huge burden on people that we see in the Acts early church, right? It says that they all the believers were one and they shared everything in common and they gave to each other as they had need. And we still here at Cascade, um, we are, or at least around the office, we are just baffled at the generosity of our church as we've been able to, in this time, give back to the community and give back in financial ways as well. And so this is something that we get to do. That's a burden for some people is financial hardship. And another thing that we see is mourning, times of mourning, times of sorrow. We see Jesus in this time, for example, uh, when his friend Lazarus died. And, and we knew the story, Jesus, you know, we get the benefit of being on this side of history and knowing the victory that was, uh, that was had there where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But when Jesus comes to his friend's family, to Lazarus's family, and sees that Lazarus has died and sees the mourning that they are in, Jesus shared in that. He took on that burden. And it actually says in John that Jesus wept with them. Jesus wept with them. He took on that burden of mourning with that family. And that's something that we can do as well. And in sickness, right, Jesus, uh, there's too many to count, too many examples to even choose from, where Jesus goes and, and he uh, not only heals the sick, but he spends time with the sick, and he helps them carry that burden. That is one of those things that we can do. When Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If we're keeping in step with the Spirit, these are the things that should define our relationships with others. This should be the backbone of our relationships with others, because the Spirit has changed who we are. It's turned us into loving people, people of patience, people with joy, people with peace. That is who we are and who we are becoming. And so not only are we to help each other become that, but we are to help love others and thus fulfill the law by carrying other people's burdens. That's something that Christians have been doing throughout history. It's, our, it's one of the best ways we can love the world around us, is to carry other people's burdens. All of these things that Paul has mentioned so far in chapter 6, he, they're kind of this, he, like I said, he switched from this inward focus of this is who I'm becoming and the pruning process that the Spirit does with this to an outward focus of, okay, now how do we help each other in that? And how do we love each other by carrying burdens? But Paul does something funny in, in verse 3. He goes back. He goes back to looking at an inward focus, and I think the reasoning will be plain and obvious when we get there. But it, in verse 3, Paul goes from this outwardly focused, you know, help restore people in sin, help prune, help cultivate the fruit in other people's lives, and help carry the burdens and love one another in this way, help carry the burdens of life. And he, he goes back and he says, if anyone thinks he is something, 
when he is nothing. He deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Paul does kind of like this 180, and he goes back to reminding them. And I think it's important we remember the context of the people that he's writing to. Right At this time, there were these Jewish Christians that were coming in and trying to to get the Gentiles to, to, yeah, believe in Jesus, believe in the grace of Jesus and all that he has done for you, receive forgiveness, but also you got to do things our way, right? Like we've been doing this a while, don't know if you know that, but you got to do things this way. You got to be circumcised. You got to eat right. You got to do all of these things. And, And Paul is writing to address that and say, no. The whole point of the gospel is that there's freedom in it, freedom from the law. And and so he's writing to these people. And so Paul finds it important enough because I think he knows the way the human mind works. I think he knows that when we read, you know, brothers, if someone's caught in sin, you should restore them and help carry the burdens. I think when I look into my own life, and when I look around at friends and I talk with them and, and other fellow believers, I think we are rather good at recognizing other people's sin. I think we're pretty good at recognizing other people's sin and helping to restore them out of it, right? I think we're, we're pretty good, by and large, especially here at Cascade, we're pretty good at seeing people who are burdened and going and helping and taking on those burdens with them. I think we kind of got that stuff down, and I think Paul, he, he was wise enough to know that it's really easy to focus on that and go, yes, I am on board. I think we as humans are all about, and we're seeing this throughout, we are all about a mission. And that's a good thing. We should have this mission. In fact, we have the great commission from Jesus where We're sent out to go and to love others and carry their burdens, but with the ultimate goal that we're making disciples. We have that. And so missions are good, but Paul is reminding us again, lest we forget, all of this has to start with us. And so he starts to go down this this path of humility, accountability, self-discipline, as he says, each one should test their own actions. Test your own actions. Go, love others, help restore people who are in sin, keep in step with the Spirit. But as you're doing so, test your own actions. It starts with me. We have to test our own actions, and then we can take pride in ourselves, or or really rather take pride in what God has done for us. What do we test our actions against? What I think Paul made that plain last week when we looked through chapter 5. We test our actions against, if these are the things, the fruit of the flesh, and these are the fruit of the Spirit, are we able to, are we humble enough, are we self-disciplined enough to look into our own lives, maybe with the help of others, maybe with the help of the Word of God, look into our own lives and test our own actions against the Spirit? And see, where is it that God is still growing me? Where is it that I need to be accountable for certain things? Where do I need some pruning done? Do I need to ask for help in that? As Joel said last week, a lot of these things are are pretty plainly obvious to the outside. And that's why I believe Paul gives this uh, in verse 1, that we should help restore each other. My question is, are you receptive to that? Am I receptive to that when people come in and they want to look for and and tell me and help restore me in those things, help prune me back so that I can continue growing in the fruit of the Spirit, growing to be more like Jesus. Is that something that I'm receptive to? And more so, is it something that I'm seeking out? Do I have relationships in my life where people are allowed to do that? Each one should test his own actions and be able to take pride in himself without comparing himself to others. Our standard here is not how good of a person am I 
compared to my neighbor? How good of a person am I compared to my spouse? Sorry, Adi, I'm not trying to say anything there, right? In fact, I'd say she's a better one, but I, I digress, right? How good, that's not our goal. Our, our standard is not other people. Paul's saying your standard is you and you alone against the word of God, against the spirit. Test your own actions before you go and you help others do the same. Test your own actions. Jesus taught on this matter, actually, um, in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus had something to say on this matter as he was teaching. It says this, Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus speaking uh, with some hyperbole there, uh, at least I hope so, um, because I don't know that he was looking at one of his disciples with a plank in their eye, right? But Jesus speaking with some hyperbole is teaching the lesson, you know, how, how do you look at someone with the speck of sawdust in their eye and be like, hey, let me get that for you. And you have this massive plank. You have this huge blind spot to the own sin in your life. You have to deal with that first. You have to deal with that first. And Paul is getting at that here. He's saying, yes, go restore others in sin. Help carry other people's burdens. But in order to do that effectively as Christ followers, we have to first test our own actions. We have to be ones who are spiritual, ones who are keeping in step with the Spirit. And ultimately, that is our responsibility. And in verse 5, Paul says this, For each should carry his own load. Now, there, there's some question, right, for those paying attention, is Paul said, carry each other's burdens, but then he says, each should carry their own load. And I, I love this because there are times, right, in Scripture, as I'm, hurry, I'm sure you've heard if you've been around the church and, and listening to preaching or reading through the Word, um, where the Bible, which was not originally written in English, um, the English translation doesn't quite capture the difference um, or, or the subtle nuances and cultural implications of certain words. I don't think that's the case here. It's actually pretty clear. You know, think about it. You have a burden and a load. If I say you are burdened with something versus you have to carry a load, those two words even in the English language, they have different connotations. They have different implications for us. And what Paul is saying here is exactly what he said in the previous two verses. There are such things as people who are burdened with stuff. They're the things that, that they need help with. Help from Jesus, help from his followers. There are times in life when we will find ourselves burdened with things. And we have to be willing to accept the help, and we have to be willing to give the help. However, that does not excuse us from carrying our own load in life. I'll give you an example here. Uh, it was about five years ago now. Uh, my wife and I just celebrated our fifth anniversary, and that's how I remember that. But five years ago, uh, my wife and I had just been married, and we had some friends, um, Michael and um, Brian Anderson here in the church and a few others. Uh, they were planning a trip to go and climb Mount Rainier, to go and make an attempt on Mount Rainier. And I had for some time thought that that would be amazing. I totally want to do that. But while they were planning to do that, I was planning a wedding and then eventually getting married. And I didn't think it was really fair of me to spend all that time during that time training, hiking, uh, and then spending, you know, a couple of nights up on the mountain with no cell service while my brand new bride had to stay home. I didn't think that was fair, so I planned not to go and to join them the next year. 
Well, something happened that was rather innocent. Uh, they were doing a training hike up to Camp Muir one weekend, which is uh, kind of the, the high base camp on Mount Rainier and um, sits up at about 10,000 feet on the most popular route up the mountain. So they were doing a training hike up there just to go. That in itself is a hike. Let me tell you what. Um, it would blow out of the water most of the hikes that you've done down here. And so I was invited to go along with them to maybe learn a little bit as they practice their crevasse rescue and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, hey, Adi, I, I'm going to go on this hike with them. Is that OK? And she's like, yeah, fine. You know, I'm still not planning to do the climb. And uh, the, the hike to Camp Muir is generally used by guides and, and people as uh, sort of this test for if you're ready to go the rest of the way. And, and the way you do that is really look at how long does it take you to get there? And really, how'd you do along that whole way? Well, uh, these guys who had been training this whole time, they'd been training for this, and uh, they were, you know, ahead of me by a little bit by halfway through the hike. And I'm dragging behind a little bit, um, and I'm starting to think, man, I am getting worked right now with my pack on and just trekking up through the snow fields and stuff like that. Well, eventually I get there to Camp Muir and they're just sitting there on the rocks waiting for me. And I get there and I ask, okay, I don't know if I want to know, but how far behind you was I? And they're like, 10, 15 minutes? Like, great job for not training. And um, I guess it pays to be young. Um, but I, I was able to make it up there and they were like, yeah, good job. So we get down after doing a bit of, uh, spending a bit of time up there, get back in the car, we're driving back and, you know, they're saying, hey, you did great today. Um, you know, would you want to join us on our training climb next week? And we're going to go climb this mountain called El Dorado. I heard of it vaguely. Um, and so we did that, got in the car, went and climbed it. And to keep a long story short, long day, exhausted, get back in the car. Um, and, you know, after we're already back in the car, Brian, who had been leading all of us in this, he tells me, he's like, oh yeah, well, that climb, that's harder than climbing a Rainier. So you could do it totally. So I go home and I, uh, first off, I was like, thanks for telling me after the fact that it's harder than Mount Rainier, the one we just did. Um, so I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I go home, I talk to Audie and I, I say, hey, they're inviting me to come and try doing Rainier with them. Now, here's where we get into carrying your own load versus being burdened. On these climbs, there are certain pieces of gear and things that you got to put in your pack and you have to have every individual has to have certain things their own food their own water their own sleeping bag uh, and climbing equipment and stuff like that you got to have all of that but there are also things that the team shares that you spread out between the packs things like tents that you're going to share you're going to sleep a couple people in a tent so you split that up between people and the main thing the most burdensome thing that you could put in your pack that you could be tasked to carry is the ropes. Ropes are heavy. When you're looking to, to keep your pack as light as possible, the rope is heavy. And so um, to me, on that first climb, I hadn't trained. They were gracious enough, the rest of the team, to carry what would have been a burden for me, being the tents and the ropes. However, I still had to carry my own load. Loads here, as Paul is talking about when he says each man should carry his own load, are, are some things like life's just routine obligations. You know, you gotta, I, I gotta provide for my family. I gotta put food on the table. Um, I gotta keep my family safe. I gotta, you know, keep myself healthy. Right. And then uh, there's also in, in our faith, there's things that are our own to take care of my individual faith and, and ministry obligations that I have. Like every believer is responsible for their faithfulness to God. They're responsible for making disciples as we've been commissioned to by Jesus. That is part of of every one of us. And since it's Father's Day, you know, we'll mention this as well, that dads, 
we're responsible for the leadership and love and protection of our families and, and, and guiding them in faith and, and being faithful to God and to them. We're responsible for that. These are things that I would say are loads. These are things that we each have to be responsible for in ourselves. When Paul tells them to look back into your own lives, these are some of the things that we're looking at. We are called to help restore others in sin. That's part of who we are. We are supposed to also love people and thus fulfill the law of Christ by helping to carry their burdens in life. However, Paul reminds us here that is not an excuse for us not to keep an eye on our own hearts. We each must still carry our own loads. And that is important because if we can't do that, then we can't do the other two. How much are we able to love others and carry their burdens if we're being burdened ourselves by the very things that are our responsibilities, by our responsibilities to our families, by um, our responsibility to being faithful to God? We have to get those things in order so that we are fit to help carry the loads or the burdens of others. So we are fit to help restore others who are in sin like others do for us. We have to have that down. I think it's pretty clear when I look at it why this is so relevant these days. We're in a culture right now at a time in our country where we are very quick to try and restore others who we believe are in sin while ignoring our own hearts. And, and so many people around us are burdened. They need the truth of the gospel. They need the love of Christ followers. They're burdened with different things throughout this life. And, and we have the opportunity, we have the ability to take on those burdens. We have the ability to guide them to the one who will ultimately help take on those burdens as well, who will ultimately change them into someone that is more like him. We have that ability if we're keeping in step with the Spirit. Are you, am I, keeping in step? Paul reminds us that we ought to help cultivate others. We ought to help carry others' burdens and love them. But we have to start with ourselves. And in this, as we are changed, like I said at the beginning, as we are changed, as we become more like Jesus, as we start to exhibit more of these fruits of the Spirit, as we keep in step with Him, we are better able to serve others and help them do the same. I, uh, when, when I was planning this last week, I'll give you an example of where I had to uh, be convicted by the Spirit. When I was planning this last week, I got to this point where Paul starts reiterating, you know, you have to you know, restore others and, and help each other with their burdens, but you have to first look into yourself. And my first thought, I kid you not, as I'm thinking that, and I think I even told it to Michael, and I wish I hadn't. My first thought was, man, people need to hear that, right? People need to hear that because we're in our culture right now so, so ready to go and to call out other people's sin, and, and we don't first look into our own hearts, and that's often obvious to me. I'm thinking, man, I've got some Facebook friends that need to hear this. And maybe, maybe as I've been talking about it, you've thought the same thing. Well, you're in good company, but as I started to write this out and, and plan this down this last week, I was convicted of that thought as I realized, is that not exactly what Paul is trying to remind us of, what Paul is trying to warn us about? 
Yes, we are called to restore others, but we're supposed to do it gently and cautiously so that we don't fall into the same temptation. I have to test my own actions. It has to start with that. I believe that that is a daily process of testing yourself against the word of God. Am I becoming more like Jesus today? Am I exhibiting more of the fruit of the Spirit today? Am I fit and able to go and to help others do the same, to help carry the burdens of others in their life? The gospel changes us. It changes who we are. And the byproduct of that, the natural byproduct, is that it then changes how we relate to others. If I am a different person, I will relate differently to others. And Paul is describing how that should work. We're, as, as we keep in step with the Spirit, we're able to help restore others and cultivate in their lives as well. It's a daily process, and as, as we keep in step with the Spirit, we are better able to fulfill the law of Christ by loving others. At Cascade, uh, we have kind of our, our motto, if you want to call it that, of L3. We believe we exist to love God, love people, and live generously. And there's been some discussion this last year about what love people means. And a lot of the discussion around loving people really revolves around this. This is what it looks like to love others, to walk with each other, to help each other grow, to be more like Christ, and to carry the burdens of one another when need be. That's what it looks like to love people, but it starts in us. It starts in me. Let's keep in step with the Spirit. Dads, on this Father's Day, as I'm thinking in my own life, I, I told you at the beginning here, I'm, I'm thinking about what it looks like to be a good father, to raise sons that will be good men who follow Jesus. I think of this. In the home is the primary place that we get to practice what Paul is laying out here especially with our kids. And so I, I want to keep in step with the Spirit. I want to test my own actions. I want to become more and more like Jesus because I know that right now, my two-and-a-half-year-old little Jasper and soon-to-be Jacob along with him, right now they want to be like me. I don't want them to be like me. I want them to be like Jesus. And so am I looking into my heart daily, keeping in step with the Spirit so that I can help bring my sons up into following Jesus, into a life of serving Him so that they are fit to help other people with that as well. So that by the time they're my age or, or older or whatever, and they have their own families, that they are able to raise their sons to do the same, that they are able to love others and carry their burdens because they are being changed and transformed daily by Jesus. We need each other. We need each other to help us keep in step with the Spirit. I'm going to pray and then we'll wrap up. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time to come and to read from your word and to learn what it means to follow you. What it looks like to have our, our lives and who we are pruned back by you so that we can grow into who you would have us to be, so that we can be more like you, Lord. And thank you that you are gracious enough that you've put us in communities where we get to do that together. God, I pray that my heart would be changed so that I would be fit to help others as you call me to do, to love others as you call me to do, 
by carrying their burdens. Amen. We need each other to help to help carry the burdens of life, to help restore us when we are in sin. And we've been getting rather creative lately during this time as we haven't been meeting together on Sundays as to how we do that. And we love that. We love hearing about you guys opening up your homes now that uh, we're being told we can do so and that it's safe. And so we love seeing that with each other. We do have a comeback plan so that we can start meeting together again. There'll be a link below in our uh, comments here and also on our website that you can go and see what our plan is. Also, we want to thank you guys for being faithful in giving, as I said before, being so generous that we've been able to give back to our community during a time where a lot of people are burdened, especially financially. So thank you for your faithful giving. And if you want to uh, learn how to give today as well, um, there'll be a link below, or you can text Cascade to 77977. We're going into a time of worship now as we close out our time this morning. So join us as we praise our gracious God.
Thanks for being with us today. We hope you've enjoyed your morning. If you're with us on Facebook, click the like button. If you're with us on YouTube, subscribe. Thank you for being a generous church and continuing to give. You are an amazing people. If you have a prayer request, we would love to hear about that and know that we are praying for you. All you have to do is go to the website, click on the connect card, fill out your prayer request. Share the gospel of Jesus with somebody, whether it's here in Monroe, across the country or around the world. We love worshiping with you. Have a great day.